Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. I am Nick Ishmael Perkins, and welcome to the third webinar in the Talk Back Better series, brought to you by the International Science Council in partnership with the Falling Walls International Year of Science Engagement Initiative. This series is part of the Public Value of Science program and came about in response to repeated calls by member institutions of the International Science Council to address, address issues which are challenging, effective research communication and evidence-based policy or indeed decision making. Talk Back Better is derived from the off-repeated call to build back better during the pandemic and is associated with the ambition to use the unprecedented crisis to transform our society in some way, rather this is to make it more resilient or a more equal society. So with the panel of experts of the Public Value of Science program, we have identified some key themes that we think are really important for organized research to address if they're going to build capacity for science engagement. This doesn't mean that we're suggesting science communication needs to be confrontational or even focused on verbal communication though. And today the theme is lessons from communication on climate change. But before I get into the substance of the discussion, I just want to cover a few bits of housekeeping, as it were. First, you will have noticed that the webinar is being recorded, and indeed, the recordings will be available of all of the sessions throughout the month. There is already a recording available of the first session on audiences and perceptions of audiences, and a recording of this session will be available within a few days and of the previous session from last week. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat. We're going to have some time to talk about that. And speaking of the chat, we encourage you to let us know where you're joining from around the world. It's always helpful for us. Now, just to talk a little bit about the structure, we have an hour and 15 minutes for today's webinar. We're going to start with uh, about 10, 15 minutes of a kind of provocation, which looks at where we're at 
Then we have a flash talk from uh, JT, a researcher who's done some work in this area and has some interesting implications for our session today. And then there will be a discussion with our panel to reflect on what we've heard and to offer some practical tips about the way forward. And it's during this period as well that we will try and answer as many questions as we can get through. So the objective of today's webinar is to share learning about public engagement from climate communication practice and research. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has over 20 years of experience engaging at the interface of interdisciplinary research, public opinion and policy. There are substantive research initiatives on the, climate, on the communication of climate change, and both advocates and scientists have demonstrably changed their approach over the years, taking the science of science communication and empirical lessons on board. Today we will explore what are the takeaways then for other sectors and other disciplines. To begin, I'm going to invite Jonathan Lynn. Jonathan was Head of Communication and Media Relations at the IPCC for over 10 years, providing policymakers with the latest assessments of the science related to climate change under the auspices of this prize-winning UN organization. He has also lectured extensively on climate change communication around the world, and he continues to consult for the IPCC, which is testament to his enduring value in the field. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. And hello, everybody. Uh, th thanks for this uh, invitation. I, I really liked your uh, framing of this opening bit as a provocation rather than a formal speech. And so I'm going to throw out a few um, facts and ideas for discussion later. This will be based on, on our practice, uh, not really from a sort of research perspective. But uh, for those of you who want to explore both the research and the uh, practice of climate change communication in more detail, I'd recommend, and maybe Gabriella, you can put up the slide. Now, there, there was a, a, a special issue, a topical collection in the journal Climatic Change at the end of last year. And you'll see a whole load of um, articles in there, some of which are, um, uh, open access, some which are unfortunately paywalled, but from both uh, theorists in the field, but also practitioners, in, including an article by me and some colleagues. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today, you, you could take that slide down, uh, uh, Gabriella. Um, what I'm going to talk about today in particular is look, focusing on the changes that the IPCC brought into its communications over the, the past 10 years while I was working there, but in particular, looking at what we did with the latest reports that have come out in the, la in the last year or so. And um, that will show us both where we've got to, but also some of the, the big challenges we, we still face. I'll start off by talking about relations with the, uh, with the media and or how we work with the media. And um, here it's important to recognize that with the IPCC, until um, the last two assessment cycles, the last two big reports that we did starting in 2011, 12, um, we didn't even issue press releases on our reports. We just produced the report and there it was, it was finalized and it was handed over to, to policymakers, to the media, to the public and you know, get, get, make, make of it what you, what you will. So we've come a long way since then, we, at least we do pr uh, press releases now and press, proper press conferences and so on, but also getting a bit more sophisticated with the media. And really the key here, I think, is to be media friendly and to be seen as media friendly because what you want is to help them work their way through what can be very complex and complicated material so to guide them through the report and ensure and do your best to ensure that they can produce balanced coverage without introducing errors into it just because you, you haven't presented it in a in a helpful way so for instance one of the things we did was um we in, we introduced embargoes we made the reports available a, uh, a couple of days um, uh, before the official release. So it's a bit tricky in our case because we never know when the report is going to be finalized. It's only ready when it's doubled down at the very end. It can change until the last minute, or at least the, the summary for policymakers, which is where the focus is, can change. And so what we would say is when, as soon as that's done, as soon as we've got a, a clean version ready to share with you, um, typically that would be on a late on a Friday or on a Saturday. You can have it ahead of the press conference on Monday and work with that. So to prepare a thoughtful and rounded uh, story. Sometimes our, our approval sessions um, 
they have been known to overrun a bit. And sometimes we don't get the two days in. Sometimes we're stuck with just a, a few hours in the worst case. But in in general, we do get get the report to people in in good time. That that was really very very appreciated, and I think that's standard practice with many many journals as well. Um, as well as that, we introduce advanced briefings, basically explaining what the IPCC is, how it works, and how it produces the report, which immediately clears up a lot of. Uh, sometimes confusion or misunderstandings about what, what, what the report is, is doing. And um, uh, we've, we've really developed that in the, in, the, in the latest cycle, which started with the special report on 1.5 degrees in 2018. And then we've had three big working group reports last August and in uh, February and April this year. And with that, we've we put more and more material available under the embargo system. So it's sort of graphics and um, uh, frequently asked questions and, and things like that. We, uh, and we've also changed the way the advanced briefings work. And because the reports are only finalized at the end, in the past, we couldn't say, uh, we couldn't really discuss what the content was, but we've realized that there's a way around that without actually getting into the final conclusions of the report, we can discuss in advance the report what the key topics are, which also helps the media prepare for it. So we've done that. And we've also put a big emphasis on sort of, um, advanced briefings on the record um, and then interviews and briefings under embargo before the report is released that enables the media to prepare more rounded stories before the, the report comes out. And um, this has really um, led, led uh, to an incredible amount of me media coverage, which really took us by surprise. I mean, we were unable to keep up with requests for interviews, for instance, at, that, at times. And um, in the 24 hours around the reports coming out, we had um, uh, well, the 1.5 degree report in, in 2018, over 11,000 stories in the month around that period it was 20 over 23,000 articles for the working group one report the one on the physical basis of climate change that came out last August in the 24 hours around that 30, oh, 38 and a half thousand articles and um, in the month 87,000 and for working groups two and three 17 15,000 articles on the day so an incredible um incredible um amount of media interest but uh, and, and and very good coverage as well we were sort of pleased with the way it goes but what what we've seen is that the media um have, have also moved on and giving them the highlights of the report um a couple of days at best, a few hours at worst, just before the report is no longer good enough. We're getting a lot of demands from media. Um, and originally, the embargo was designed for media working in time sensitive conditions like uh, wire services and broadcasters. But now all media want to produce rounded packages, including interviews and graphics and video, maybe. And they need a lot of time to do that. So we're getting calls to to um, make, make the report available before release for several days, even a week. And this operationally, that would be extremely challenging for us uh, for you know, various technical reasons, but we're gonna have to look at how we can respond to that demand. So that's thoughts on media. I'd also like to say a bit about the different audiences that we work with. For the IPCC, it's very clear that our main audience is, is policymakers, that's who we're doing it for. So governments and, and negotiators. Uh, but of course, there are lots of other stakeholders who are interested in it, practitioners um, in different fields affected by climate change, the scientific community, and of course, the general public. And um, we've, um, we, we've seen the, an enormous growth in public interest, which is both a result of the reports that we're producing, but is also the, this interest in the question of climate change, which has really just been totally galvanized and transformed in, in the last few years, has also fueled the media interest in, in our work as well. Um, so the different audiences that are out there all have different levels of expertise, different areas of interest, perhaps different regional areas of interest. How, so how, how, can, how can you address them? And uh, this, this, this requires producing a whole series of different derivative materials, press 
perhaps press releases, but other support materials and support, preparing different presentations. And frankly, for the IPCC, whose permanent structure was just a secretariat of a dozen people, including four people working on communications um, and backed up by one or two communication specialists in each of the working groups that work on an individual report, it's impossible for us to handle that sort of level of, of variety. And basically what we do is we, we provide the basic generic uh, presentation and, and, and report, but then we rely on other groups who are interested in communicating about climate change to pick that up. And if you like, we're in the center of a series of concentric circles who can talk to those different audiences. So we then have to make a, an effort to communicate with them. So with environmental NGOs, with, um, with the scientific community at scientific conferences, uh, the, the AGU and so on. But, but we are ourselves increasingly looking at, can we go a bit further and do something that is a bit more targeted? So particularly doing things that are more regionally targeted, at least for the sort of high level policymakers and the immediate practitioners and scientific community in those countries, we're starting to, to look at that. Of course, and this might come up in the discussion later, there's a whole load of uh, discussion and research on how you talk to different audiences with different political perspectives on the question of, of climate change. That's not something we get into so much though, we do follow it closely and we're aware of the, the implications of it. So we can talk about that a bit later. And then lastly, I'd like to say a bit about it accessibility, um, really looking in particular at the terminology and the language that we use. We put a lot of effort into training the authors of our reports in how they handle interviews and other public engagement. Basically, you know, focus on a few key messages. Don't try and say everything and express it simply and clearly. So we give them a lot of practice in, in doing that. And, uh, and there as well, avoid um, avoid jargon words like sort of mitigation and transpiration which nobody who is who isn't any anyone who isn't a specialist won't understand those terms even though they might be core to what the report is is writing about especially something like mitigation and then a, a lot of vocabulary a lot of text has a specialist scientific meaning um well actually one of the first things i came across was um, moral fractions, which didn't mean anything to me except like uh, hurting small furry animals. But um, a lot of other terms are you know, very tricky. Aerosols, it's not something you just squirt on yourself to make you smell nice. Uh, they're, they're suspended you know, particles in the air in the, in the scientific terminology. Positive, negative can have very different meanings. I mean, most for the general public, positive means um, it's good. Uh, oh, you know, honey, I got my the results in my biopsy today. The doctor told me it was positive. That's good, isn't it? But same, you know, in, in climate change, positive correlation. And, you know, so there's a whole load of that vocabulary. Now you can, it's not just a case of perhaps common sense or awareness. You can actually look at this from a, in an evidence-based way. We've done a lot of internally of, of user testing of, of terminology and, and, and graphics. And uh, we've even uh, had some re research commissioned for us. So the, the University of Southern California, and that, that's actually, the paper, there's a paper about that in the climatic change article, uh, special issue I mentioned. Um, they, they looked at half a dozen key bits of terminology that our scientific leadership identified as being core to um, the latest report, the reports that we're putting out. And for instance, this, they looked at this within an audience in the United States, adaptation, which is sort of fundamental to what we're talking about in climate change. For many people, that's about turning a, a book into a movie. It's nothing to do with, with uh, climate change. Sustainable development is another basic con concept which we wouldn't think is is um is ambiguous but people hear development and they think real estate so sustainable well it must be something to do with the environment then so you have to be very careful how you use those terms at least, if, if not in the report then at least in the way you talk about them to the to the public and as i say you can you can apply this approach to um graphics and um and uh finally um what we've done a lot of with, with, with the authors of our reports is we've worked with them to ask them how they would express 
these terms to non-specialist audiences. And um, we found a surprising degree of agreement among, among it when we, when we pushed it. So we were able, in the end, we were able to turn our media training exercise into the main way of generating the key messaging for the reports is we could find the consensus among the authors, get them to think, how am I going to say this? And bring that together, re reiterate it with them, with the authors, with the scientific leadership, and find a very strong bottom-up uh, produced uh, key messaging. Well, I'll, I've, I'll, I'll stop there and, and let the others uh, speak and uh, look forward to the discussion uh, in a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, that was very interesting. I have lots of questions for you, <laughs> but I think I will I will save them. I just want to kind of um, draw particular attention to a couple of things that you've mentioned. Um, what really struck me was this the, the issue, you know, when you talk about the advanced briefings and the transparency around the research process. This is something that we have seen discussed at, at some length in, 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 in um, other spaces and the value of proving trustworthiness by being quite transparent. And it's interesting to hear you talk about that. Um, it's also interesting to hear how your reflections on um, the value of derivative materials and partnership underscores your strategy around audience segmentation. Again, I think there's a lot that we can say there and something that will resonate, I think, across um, the communication of science in, in other sectors. And of course, the thing that I find perhaps most fascinating about um, climate communication is the terminology. And, and it's interesting to hear that you've actually invested in user testing. And I mean, of course, I have, you know, some interesting reflections on how some terms have actually evolved, you know, so now people talk from climate change to climate emergency and, and so on. And it'd be interesting to hear your reflections on this and uh, and also on, on, on this media training exercise, which kind of seems to allow you to co-create the messaging. And I think, again, all very interesting. I just want to, we're, before though, Jonathan has a chance to talk about this some more, we're going to move on um, in a minute to the flash talk. But I would just like to point out that a number of the links that Jonathan has referenced are actually in the chat. And we will be putting links in the chat as we go along, um, just so that you're aware of that. Um, and we are monitoring, I, I, you know, again, welcome various um, participants from around the world, um, very encouraged by that. But I want to move on now to our flash talk. When we conceived these webinars, um, we felt it would be important to balance some kind of discursive analysis with some very practical tips. And we thought that it'd be nice to have somebody who's doing some really interesting cutting edge research take five minutes to reflect on the work that they're doing and how it could be useful as a showcase um, for our discussion. And we're very lucky um, because we've been able to engage uh, Jagdaj Teka or JT as he's commonly referred to, um, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Auckland and also an affiliate researcher at Yale, George Mason University and the National University of Singapore. His research on understanding public business and policy engagement with climate change has been covered in newspapers around the world. And JT has very kindly recorded his flash talk today because he actually is in the mountains of uh, Cash Kashmir um, as we speak. Um, so I'm going to actually share with you his video, which is going to last about five minutes. Kia ora koutou. My name is JT, Dr. Jagadish Thakur. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Auckland in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I research on climate change, science and health communication. Thank you for this opportunity. I want to highlight three key challenges and ways I see we can resolve them to the field of climate change communication based on my own research experience. These are the knowledge gap on climate change between the global north and the global south, our ability or rather inability to listen to voices of the poor and the disenfranchised populations when prioritizing research or when planning policies and how the promise of climate action as also addressing existing social and economic inequality has been derailed, but now is back on uh, the agenda through debates on loss and damage. 
One of the key challenges to communicating climate change has been the persistent knowledge gap between the global north and south on climate change. This gap is most visible in public opinion on climate change over the last decade, but is also available, is also visible in scientific research and the gap of scientific research publications between the global north and the south. Ability to conduct scientific research and the efficacy of such scientific research influencing policy, not just domestic energy and environmental policies, but also foreign relations is hampered in several poor and developing countries due to this persistent knowledge gap. The knowledge gap probably persists because we have tried to bring people to climate science rather than take climate science to the people. I should say that several scientists have tried and are trying to connect climate change to everyday people's experience of extreme weather events, heat waves, and to a limited degree, health impacts on climate change with limited success. As we all know, risk and vulnerability is as much about exposure and impact as about the social relations. Perhaps why we haven't succeeded as much as we should have to increase public knowledge and engagement with climate change is because we have banked too much on connecting with people's experiences, but not with people's aspirations, particularly so in poor and developing countries. Even in developed countries, the fear of losing jobs, impact our economy, and in lifestyle change. For example, famously in the words of George W. Bush, the American way of life is not up for negotiation, has been weaponized by the fossil fuel industry. What I feel is that the fear of loss hasn't been met with this match in hope, hope for a better future for us and for our grandkids. Another failure I feel as a communication researcher has been our inability to listen to the voices of the poor, marginalized, dispossessed in shaping climate change research and policy. Our inability to see and measure the interconnected biodiversity, the impact of say energy policies on household gender relations, the choice of a crop on a girl child education, the impact of extreme weather events on intergenerational equity has left us with top-down solutions with little or no empirical research on the impacts of our climate change, environment, and biodiversity policies on people's lives. For example, some of the research on carbon credits show that not only do they fail to offset the amount of pollution, but also disrupt the local economies and ecologies in the process. Ultimately, the polluters get a free hand, they get a guilt-free pass to keep emitting while local communities suffer from natural, financial, social, and long-term livelihood impacts. For too long, we have been funding capacity building programs that flow one way from the experts to the community members. Maybe we also need to build the capacity of our scientific institutions to listen and work with people in a democratic setup. The third challenge I see is that some of the research on climate change, at least as it was conceived earlier in countries such as India, was first promised to be about social and economic equality. The scientists and the civil society members attracted to climate change and climate science came with the hope that climate change will deliver also on other pressing issues of poverty, pollution, inequality, gender justice, and others. These alignments continue to exist, but few of the sectors, sectors such as the energy sector have dominated the discussion board and could have been done more with social and cultural research on the impacts of and adaptation to climate change. Instead, climate change in the last three decades has rather created its own inequalities in scientific knowledge production, inability of such knowledge to dovetail into policymaking process, and not to talk about inequalities that has already logged in for people from the poorest and most vulnerable countries. Social and cultural change along with climate change is inevitable. The role of scientists and social scientists is to make social change possible with the least amount of social friction, keeping in mind, as Gandhi said in his talisman, the impacts of our action on the last person as our first priority. I remain hopeful that we shall resolve the persistent knowledge gap between the global north and south, that we, are, we will be better listeners, and that we will see the global nature of climate change not just from a scientific lens, but from a cultural, social, and political change lens as well. Thank you for your time. Cheers. 
Um, that's a very interesting provocation as well from, from JT there. Um, again, indeed, how do we take climate science to the people? Um, and how do we ensure capacity building for science institutions as opposed to um, in conceiving capacity building as something that happens to other people or lay people? Um, and yeah, I hope as well that we will get to talk a little bit about the interaction between climate change, um, research, and a broader agenda of social change. Um, now, we come to the opportunity for some reflection amongst the members of our panel. Let me introduce this panel. Um, first, we have Ines Ponce de Leon, who is an associate professor at the Department of Communication at Ateneo de Manila University, where she teaches, among other things, popular science communication. She also writes a weekly column for the Philippine Daily Inquirer, the Philippines' most widely circulated newspaper. Most importantly, her range of accomplishments from novelist to belly dance teacher makes her a truly original thinker and a delight to talk to. Welcome, Inesh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick. Good evening from Manila. <laughs> And Andrew Wevkin, the founding director of the Initiative on Communication and Sustainability at Columbia University's Climate School. He is one of America's most honored and innovative environmental journalists. I'm deeply grateful that he is also a member of the panel of experts on the public value of science um, program at the ISC because he, our work has benefited enormously from his insights and generosity. I encourage you all to subscribe to his newsletter at revkin.bulletin.com. Welcome, Andrew. So It's really great to be part of this. Thank you. Let's start. I'm going to start by asking um, Ines, any reflections on what you've heard from Jonathan and or JT? Oh, quite a lot. And thank you very much for making me part of this panel. And it's such an honor to be part of such a luminous panel of luminaries. I, uh, words are not enough. But I, yes, there was so much to think about. I've been taking notes throughout uh, uh, both the video and the, the speech. I, I love the idea of thinking in terms of aspirations rather than experiences. And I like that because we're often told as communicators to know what people have experienced, to know who people are, but often we've never been asked to ask, what do people dream about? And, or what do they hope for in the future? And perhaps that would allow us a bridge into their hopes and a bridge into uh, communication that is fruitful as much as it is reflective. One thing that I have one thing that I did think about, however, in terms of aspirations is that often in the developing world, especially in countries that have been former colonies, the term aspirations or dreams often has to do with, there is no other word for it, things that emit carbon in the city, a house, a car, these are taken as, you know, aspirations. These are the dreams that people have. And how I was wondering, how can that be reconciled? I mean, coming from trying to get into people's aspirations, trying to reach them from their hopes, how do we try to move them away from these kinds of aspirations towards something more global, to think less of how will my family be more mobile in a city flooded with traffic and often flooded with water, and you know, think in terms of global, fewer pollutants, climate change, which is far greater in scope, far wider in range, far longer in, in terms of the years, in terms of, the, of thinking. Dr. I, Linz, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I think you just froze for a second and I thought you had paused, but I don't want to interrupt you. Was there something else you wanted to add, Ines? Oh dear, I'm so sorry. I, I really wish the internet were more stable. But I, I did like the idea. I, I loved how there is so much training for scientists nowadays. I came from molecular biology. And way back when, I had no training whatsoever. I was just told, stand on stage, talk nicely, have good clothes on, be nice, and you know speak good English. Okay, 
no problem. And then you get shouted at by farmers and you get shouted at by NGOs and then you don't realize what the problem is. And it's really, and I want to bring this back as well to the idea that we often bring people to the knowledge and tell them, take this and just understand it and make of it what you will, as Dr. Lin said. But, you know, 20 years ago is a today and I'm just so glad and I love how there's so much training so much bottom up so much grounded work with both scientists and media and practitioners all coming together it's really hopeful yes I mean I would agree I think I was very um impressed with a number of things that Jonathan talked about for instance in the IPCC you know this particularly this idea of using the media training as a way to kind of build consensus and to and really to use the training to influence the the, the scientists themselves um but I think you make an, an important point right because what you're describing this is a is a really fundamental it's a philosophical but it's also a programmatic challenge for us which is how do you draw on people's aspirations which becomes part of their very idea of who they are and what their society should be um andrew any thoughts oh many you know we could have a multi-part a multi-part series uh, like a netflix series on this um, just a few thoughts initially on Jonathan and the IPCC. Uh, you know, I've been writing about this since before there was an IPCC since 1988 and uh, watched the, the evolution of uh, the IPCC's relationship with the public's, public's plural, uh, you know, and it's been lumpy um, and there's been a lot of learning. There, there are several, I think, realities that are tough. And there was a question already that I got at one, which is, so simply just person power that as the information environment has exploded um, it's it's not possible for a staff of three or four people to somehow manage the story uh, so what do you do um, well this is where the the larger ipcc community hundreds of scientists uh, many of whom are communicative with training can be out in the public sphere uh, on social media helping to um, engage uh, you know, uh, in, in ways that illuminate the, the realities. Uh, there's great examples, Lisa Shipper, uh, Richard Betts, uh, lead authors of various sections of the IPCC process uh, posted Twitter threads and building that community, making a communicative community around the, the uh, whether it's an IPCC report or something from ISC or uh, whatever institution you're at uh, is more important now than the press release in a way. Uh, and, and to some extent, producing graphics can, that, or other elements that can be propagated can help to do this. And it's, this is not unique to the IPCC. I wrote during the early days of the pandemic about the infodemic, as the World Health Organization described it. And uh, Laurie Garrett, a great pandemic journalist, uh, wrote a piece in, uh, I think it was Nature, commentary on, 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 again, on this budget constraint, you know, the, the, the limits of what the IPCC budget is for uh, not just for the staff, but for the uh, ancillary uh, team, uh, like Climate ne Nexus and uh, the UN Foundation has little money. I think that they throw at some of the propagation of information, but it's tiny, it's, it's tiny. So, so that's why the initiative I work on at Columbia is really about sort of spreading the gospel of ways to, you're not gonna defeat, you're not gonna change someone as, as that JT's work in Australia showed, you know, these, uh, and Dan Kahane at uh, Yale, his uh, work on what he calls cultural cognition. You're not going to change someone who's dug in on a contentious issue, uh, but you can help broaden the conversation. You can look for opportunities to uh, engage someone around the point that is a point of difference. You can always find a point of common commonality. So uh, there's lots to talk about there. Um, and that's how do you how do you build that? It's attention in scientists on being a public person and being a scientist and worrying about how do you stay, you know, cue to the discipline and also still be a person. And there I, I've come up with my own, I call it a two sentence rule. Uh, if, you, if you, here's my science, period. You know, I work on sea ice change in the Arctic. Uh, uh, here's what I feel as a voter and, and a parent and uh, someone who cares about the future. And if you do it in two compartments, then that can be a pathway to, to credibility, trust, engagement. If you try to mash it all together, we, this is there are a lot of scientists, unfortunately, who do this. They 
Uh, I am a climate scientist. I'm a Nobel Prize winning this, and we need a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's saying two very different things and, and drawing on your, your uh, authority uh, in climate science to say we need a carbon tax is a completely different arena. So, so the two sentence rule is, is helpful. I mean, I think this is really interesting. Um, it reminds me of some of the things that we covered in the first webinar, which was about common misconceptions around audiences. And one of the points that was made there, I think, very articulately, and, and you've just referenced it, Andrew, is that, you know, we have to think when people are making decisions, it's not just facts. It's also about values and feelings and lived experience. And so, you know, we have to recognize that actually we cannot trade in perceptions just thinking of facts. And that this in turn is related to people's social identities. And that is something that we need to be very aware of, aware of and mindful of engaging, engaging around. Um, I want to actually now turn to Jonathan. Um, among the, the many things that, that you mentioned, Jonathan, I was particularly intrigued about this evolving, because you, you are very clear that the audience of the IPCC is policymakers, but it is also very clear for me from when you were talking that you understand the value of publics, as Andrew says. I mean, this is one of the things that we're saying in, in science communication, there's no such thing as the general public. You know, you have to be always thinking about what's the segmentation. Um, and it is clear to me that you, as the IPCC, you've come to recognize the value of publics. And I think, as I say, too, it's really interesting the way you've approached this. And I think it's a useful model that you have in your segmentation. You've thought about institutional partners who are better positioned to engage with different, you know, different audience segmentation. Um, and so my question is, and I see that there is, and this is prompted as well by a question by Mahiri, I, I may have mispronounced your name, Mahiri, I, I hope I haven't. Um, it says here, media reach is fantastic. I feel, however, that dissemination of reports, presentations, and press releases are really only half the job. What steps do we need to support this fantastic reach with dialogue, which actually can result in other bits of society um, owning the issues and subsequent behavior and challenges? And I see that Jonathan has actually shared a, a model for this. But what I want to ask Jonathan is how your if you are going to be talking to somebody who's working outside of climate change, what would you say to them about thinking about policymakers and the general public or, or, or publics? You know, what's the kind, what, what would be the lesson that you would say there? Well, when, when we talk about, um, when we, we talk about policymakers, um, so all, Almost all, all of them, by, by no means all, but almost all of them are non-specialists in, in, in science. And so already we have to present information in a way that would um, be accessible to all sorts of other audiences as well. And also for policymakers, again, in, in, in many countries, perhaps not all, policymakers are responsive to different communities, stakeholders, the, the general public, if it exists, as as voters and, and taxpayers. So already when you when you talk to them, um, you 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 can you can be reaching out to all sorts of different other other people as as well. Um, the, the, I think that one of the tricky things for us um, that we've found with communication is people can see very clearly that there's a you know there's a big problem and something needs to be done. And they we get criticized for not responding with a kind of urgency because we're doing a very balanced thorough assessment of all the scientific literature and people are asking us for well, clear answers the IPCC should tell us what what's going to be done and we can't do that we have to be balanced and objective and so on so all we can do is lay out different options to people say okay if you if you want to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees and that's not the IPCC telling you to do that. That's you as policymakers on your reading of the science saying going beyond that would be very dangerous. Then these are the different ways you can do that. And we're, we're not telling you you've got to have a, 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 a radical transformation of society in every way. We're just saying if you want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, every scenario that you look at will involve a radical transformation of society. So that's what you're signing up to. And this is what it's going to look like in detail. Here are the pros and cons of the different things. But it's it's um we're we're kind of working in a slightly different um 
sphere to um, what An Andrew has been talking about and in Inez as well, because we're 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 not in really engaged in that political discussion that really is the next is the next step. We're sort of we what we try to do is lay out the facts, lay out the options. This is what the science is telling us. Now you, with your various values, can can decide what is appropriate for you as a community. And in some cases, it's an individual community. In some cases, it's the, the global community. And so you have to work out a way of coming together on that. Yes, I see Andrew has a, a comment. I mean, but what strikes me is that nonetheless, Jonathan, you are engaging with the political economy around which these decisions are being made. That it strikes me that that's that's quite clear that you are cognizant of that. Yes, I mean, very, very, very much so, because the, the questions that come to us is, OK, so how much is this going to cost? And then you have to put that in a perspective. Well, how much is it going to cost if you don't do anything? That's there's a there's a bit there's a broader question there. Or if we do this, does it, it cost something? But what are the benefits of doing it? And so on, especially when you get into that area of of the word I said we shouldn't use mitigation, but the the a big chunk of the the action, the response, how you how you how you reduce emissions and stop climate change, then you get into into questions of politics of of economics, uh, which are inevitably value value laden, and we we've moved in, in in looking at that. We in the latest report we actually started to look at the if you like the. Um, the demand side of climate change. What is it that motivates people to take decisions to consume carbon? What is it that, you know, so as well as looking at what is producing the carbon, what's the supply side, if you like, what's, what is, what is, what is the, what is, uh, what motivates individuals, households, companies, countries to, to consume that? And then again, that can feed into the, into the policy discussion. Okay, that's a very clear example. Um, Andrew, I'm going to, I know you want to say something, and I'm hoping that as you're responding, that you also, there's a question here from, from Tara, um, who says that she knows that, because she does a lot of training um, around climate outreach, and that a lot of climate experts think that actually it's outside of their job um, to do public engagement and so on. And the question is, do you think the IPCC might have the capacity to formally recognize climate ambassadors within the IPCC scientific community to give them a more, more of a supported mandate? So um, I'll, start, I'll, I'll start by answering that. I, 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 I don't think that formalization is an answer to any communication question in the, in the media environment we're in now. Uh, because it takes work. Uh, how do you how do you determine who is a good ambassador? How do you vet that? Um, how do you keep track? It's it's really about creating an environment, uh, you know, with incentives uh, and uh, connectivity, so that scientists feel comfortable engaging. And not every scientist should be on social media. Absolutely not. Not every journalist should be on social media. Um, but for those who are, and there are many, uh, and, and all around the world, there's wonderful examples in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia as well. Um, finding a way to uh, track that, uh, even Twitter is interesting. Uh, it, it can be used in all kinds of ways that uh, you can monitor the IPCC uh, discussion, uh, just as uh, in Jakarta right now, the, there's an agency that is using Twitter as a real-time way to track fl flood patterns across Jakarta. And, and that data, the data are there. Um, so I, I just think you wanna create an atmosphere of encouraging folks to, to, to get at those messages. The, um, I, was, I was drifting away though from the point that, I, oh God, I was trying to, I wanna bring up a couple of things. Say, say remind me, uh, there was this other thing before that specific question. It's early in the morning here. Yeah, I know Jonathan was talking about, um, you know, how, because I'd asked a follow up question about the political economy, but Jonathan was. Oh, yeah, yeah, politics. Yeah, I mean, the IPCC is, is in a box, okay? It was created in 1988 to advise the world's governments uh, on what's happening with the climate system. And then the, uh, the, the working groups evolved. Uh, the most contentious one is really the uh, what do you, the the options uh, mitigating warming uh, adaptation never has gotten enough attention. Uh, one 
structural issue that I don't think the IPCC itself can do anything about is the fact that it's so strung out. It's kind of like when Charles Dickens used to write his novels as a serial a serialization. <laughs> to have these working groups spread out over sometimes more than a year. Uh, as he said, you got 80,000 stories around the uh, working group one, which is the physical science. And what happens is advocates fill in the blanks. So here's this big news, the new, you know, glaciers are doing X more than they were uh, heat waves or this. And, and so the conversation isn't really about the results in that in the report as much as what the secretary general is saying and, and what uh, you know advocates are saying on one side or the other. And then you have to wait months for the uh, adaptation report, which is the, you know, for the most communities, the thing they want to know is, are they at risk? Climate risk, I, I, years and years ago, I proposed, would we have been better off with an intergovernmental panel on climate risk as opposed to climate change? And I think the answer is yes, because that's the thing people care about. But you don't even get to that till months in, and then and then the emissions reduction is is a yet another ch uh, chapter, and the media dribbles off. So, but yeah, but there's no. I don't know, Jonathan. I, I think it's not. You know, it's up to the countries to to change the ground rules, and they're not going to do it. So, it's to some extent, that that the political questions that revolve around the IPCC process. Uh, are just not going to be easily resolved, I think. Yeah. I mean, you're, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And um, the uh, these are matters of the governments who are our, our members. Uh, it's, it's up to them to decide if they want to change things. I mean, with the, the str stringing out, it's partly the, the, the first chapter, if you like, the work of physical science basis is the foundation for everything. So the they can't complete the adaptation and mitigation sections until they've seen and thought about what is it finally in working group one. They sort of, they kind of spark off that to an extent. Obviously they're preparing it before working group one is finished, but they have to wait and see that before, before they come. But it is a problem. And um, if I can just sort of Pick up, um, you, you, you said in, in response to the other question, a lot of authors shouldn't be on, on social media. And, um, or, and I mean, you're absolutely right there. Not all, not all scientists are communicators or want to communicate and, and why should they? But um, many, many can, and, they, they, and then we as organizations should help them. And um, they, I mean, if, you, if you're involved in an area of science, it's not abstract, you know, climate change or public health. These are the things which have a, you know, a, a huge interest to, to the public and every part of society. It seems that scientists who do work would then have an interest in presenting that work to the broader community so that it can have some effect. And we assume that's the case with, with our, so we make, we make our media training available to all. We know they're not all gonna do it. And in fact, it, to, to answer Tara's question specifically, our authors are the ambassadors of the IPCC. I mean, we, we try to give them the tools to be able to speak in any audience in their country or when they're visiting a conference or to the media to represent that to represent their work, but also to represent the work of the IPCC and to do it in, a, in an objective way. And if I can if I can just pick up on some of the other questions that came out at the begin at the beginning, Nick, you, me you mentioned the importance of transparency in uh, research, and that's um, that's. Uh, um, I mean, with the IPC isn't a research body, so we don't do original research. Our job is to assess all the research that's been published. But still, there are a lot of misconceptions about the way we work. So almost as important as presenting the science is to present to different audiences, this is what the IPCC is, how it works, what it does. We often get criticized for allowing governments to interfere in the production of our reports. Well, that the government um, commentary is an, an integral part of our, uh, we're set up, we're actually set up to bring in government comment. They do influence it, that's whole, because the reports aren't being produced as a kind of ivory tower academic exercise. Mm -hmm. They're being produced as a tool for governments to use. So we have to make sure they're fit for purpose. Um, and also just some uh, JT's really thought provoking ideas about global north, global south. It's a huge challenge for the IPCC to get more. I mean, this is only just touching on a very small part of what JT was talking about as well. 
but to just to bring more scientists into the process from the global south. And um, a lot of our presentational work when we take, take our reports to different countries is trying to talk to the local scientific community and saying, come along, you can, you can work for us too. You can provide comments, you can publish papers, which we can assess. There are huge knowledge gaps, information gaps about your region, please publish science on that. But a long way to go for, for, for sure, but it's something we're very, very aware of. And um, there was a question that Andy already replied to about this disinformation. I, I think at least in my personal experience around the IPCC, we haven't had a big problem dealing with septics, people who just don't deal with climate change. And we know they're out there, but basically we produce what the, we tell people what the science is saying and it's there. And then other people might work more closely with those different audiences and more intelligently to sh show them what, what's being, what being said and how that relates to their, 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 their personal lives and values, or as Ina says, their, their, their aspirations. But a big problem we have isn't so much disinformation as misinformation. So people misunderstand what we're saying, which means that perhaps we're not communicating as efficiently as we could. But if you remember when the 1.5 degree report came out, there was a big discussion about oh, 12 years left to save the world. And we weren't saying, this came out in 2018, the report referenced various things happening in 2030. We weren't saying, sorry guys, you've got 12 years left and then we're sort of over the, the precipice. It's that 2030 was a milestone on the way to solving the problem. And if, if we are dealing with it at 2030, this is where we would be. But if we're not, if we're not there, um, and by 2030, it doesn't, it's by no means means game over. And uh, um, a US climate scientist, Michael Mann, who's an excellent communicator, talked about this the other, the other day where he said, it's not about falling off a precipice. Uh, you know, you, we're working on it, we either make it or we don't and game over. It's not that. What it is, is we're in a minefield. How do we dodge? dodge these different minds and we don't really know what's out there to come back to the question of risk that the really important question of risk that Andy mentioned what are the risks of doing nothing of of carrying on as we are what are we stumbling into um, yeah this question sorry I was just going to say yeah. quick, I think the question of, of, of communicating risk and uncertainty is central generally to science communication and I think is particularly urgent in the context of, of climate change um you know still you've put something here in the in very um quietly into the chat which <laughs> I, um was immediately interesting and i think it's quite central to this discussion because i mean so jonathan has explained that actually you know the ipc is working with with governments but of course we recognize that governments themselves are shaped by their national polity you know as they say you get the government you deserve and that actually you know if their constituencies were to shift their perspective aspirations as you said their needs that actually you know things might be able to change and there have been a couple of comments now about the the the, the challenge of engaging consumers as um as dominico talks about it um how you know how do we actually start to impact on the popular culture Again, you yourself talk about aspirations. What are the, you know, what do we begin to do here? And you yourself say that actually we have to be careful because a lot of influencers are not themselves scientists and not being very well referenced. Do you want to kind of elaborate on this? Because it strikes me that this is a central idea that we need to get our heads around. Okay. Um, yeah, this is an idea just to, just came to my head much, much earlier when Jonathan was talking about being friendly to the media. That's, that's great. Uh, we do need to recognize that being friendly to the media means reaching out to a group that has a very different culture from scientists. They need news on the fly, immediate news, whereas scientists work with long term, with uncertainty, with, with terms that the media might not necessarily translate. And even if they do, it might not be in the way that scientists would, would appreciate or would, would match with what scientists say, or the way that the public should understand them. But I think there has been a greater change in these last few years with the rise of, oh, I hate to use this word, the influencers, the vloggers, TikTok. Uh, and we've seen 
especially in terms of elections and political communication, especially here in the Philippines, we've seen that misinformation is so rampant and spreading so fast amongst those who work in unrefereed territory, the vloggers, the people who don't have editors to answer to. So I was throwing this out as a question, perhaps how might we consider them as well? That's one, because now we've had, we, we have such a volatile media environment. In fact, a few days ago, the newly elected Philippine president just started accrediting or proposed accrediting vloggers to be part of the press corps and sh shut out some legitimate news outlets. So people were asking, what, what to you then is a legitimate journalist? And you know, now that the media system has evolved so fast, you know, it may, is there any initiative on that? That's one. And the second one is, and this is something that came to mind when, when JT talked about the disenfranchised. Have there been initiatives, especially lately, and especially with the changing media environment, to collaborate with communities so that we have another ground up approach where we work with very specific communities so that they can produce their materials in the way that they understand climate change and typhoons and natural hazards? Have there, has there been research or have there been programs around that? Because I can foresee that as a sort of workaround. Now that the broadcast media environment is changing, perhaps it's better to go to ground, talk to people, mm -hmm. be specific. I think, is, I think this is really interesting. And I've heard this term disaster imagination. Yes. And this is, yeah, you know, and, and, and that this is quite fundamental, people's imagination of what the disaster could be, what it might be, and as, a, as an important leverage for the kind of policy change that, you know, JT describes and which actually the IPCC is fundamentally concerned with right because you know what you yeah I mean I, I I can imagine it's quite an interesting um pressure here the just before I move on though actually Ines do you because I know you said you posed a question it's you're putting it out there but do you yourself have any thoughts on how to respond to this question about the accreditation of influencers how do we what, what are your thoughts on how we might manage that Oh dear, you opened the Pandora's box. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> I don't think I can respond to that in just, just a few minutes, but it's it's a hot button issue at the moment in the Philippines because it's it's thorny. It has to do with a lot with history and the political um, environment of the Philippines right now. But I think at, someone wrote this just a few days ago, and I, it's quite provocative. Another Another columnist in another newspaper wrote that perhaps they're not the enemy, the vloggers are not the enemy. Maybe we have to ask, and this is the researcher in me talking, maybe we have to ask what are they doing right and what do people understand about them and what do people like about them? And maybe we can see where journalists have been remiss in their own mission of you know, providing the truth, not for the purpose of copying from the vloggers or the TikTokers or whoever else is the influencer of the moment, but acknowledging that our audiences, our publics have their own trust networks. And maybe in understanding those trust networks, we can come up with another set of solutions, another set of communication that don't necessarily supersede the broadcast media, but become a complement to, so that we can ensure that we actually listen and talk to people rather than come back into the trap of broadcast media, talk at people, we're accredited, you're not, elite press, you're not. And then it, you know, we just come back to the trap of alienating the audience once again. So that's, you know, that's the researcher part of me talking. I don't think I can talk more about the accreditation. Mm -hmm. That would be a whole other. No, and game. I think actually, but this is already, <laughs> I think, a very helpful um, uh, addition and, and very useful framing. Um, just, I, I, there is one comment here from um, Sandra that's, um, that says, it feels like there's a presumption of literacy when we talk about the publics and any thoughts and i can see that might be particularly you know you consider the audience of the ipcc um but what thoughts might any of you have about addressing communicating with oral cultures again this comes from a perspective uh, thinking 
uh, 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 about the impact that that has on the societal change that JT has talked about and, and also that Jonathan has inferred, um, you know, around kind of political legitimacy and so on. Andrew, were you going to so say the, something? Yeah. The thing that immediately comes to mind is the work for a couple of decades of uh, developing radio partners, which is a, uh, it works with radio stations and all around the world and places that are, uh, where their liter literacy is low, where radio is a, a key portal to people, uh, you, you know, through, this is through telenovelas and uh, 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 call-in shows now that their cell phones are ubiquitous, even in areas that are still, um, you know, not, struggling um, where women can have a, a vo uh, have a, a conversation about uh, issues related to safety or uh, uh, health care um, maternal care through a radio station that that they can't otherwise find a safe path to do so developing I think it's developing radio.org uh, more than 20 years of work on that uh, the BBC has a uh, the BBC action has a woman Lisa Robinson who I know through the the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Agency uh, uh, knows a lot about those kinds of models too. Uh, they require work. How do you scale those? And radio is cool because the scale can be large from a, you know, it's a signal that everyone can hear. Uh, but other than that, it's hard because getting that down to the granular level to engage and have trust in a community in a volcano zone or, or you know, a flood zone for climate question uh, is, is tough. One, one last example is um, the Ford Foundation has quietly been funding a, a, a network of indigenous communicators. Uh, if not us, then who? Just Google for if not us, then who? And they are becoming, uh, uh, to some extent, public figures using TikTok and, and other. Uh, See so if you, you can kind of enable voices uh, to get into that arena, uh, that could be useful. I mean, I think this is one thing, this is an important point to make, huh? that actually um, we're not suggesting that all influencers are necessarily bad. And I think, you know, it's again, you know, the point you make is actually kind of let's think about what, because these folks are doing something very effectively, and some of them are doing it effectively and doing it actually with the shared normative values of scientists, right? Um, the, I, I, I want to, because we're coming to the last 10 minutes, um, and Jonathan, there's a question I'm dying to ask you, um, which is about the emergence, the way that terms evolve and adapt. So, for instance, you know, we talked at one point, there was a little discussion, we had to say climate change, maybe we should be talking about climate emergency, global warming, global heating. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. But I'd also like you to share if there's one takeaway from today for the communication, you know, um, research communicators. Um, working across other disciplines or other sectors, what would it be? So yeah, two, um, two questions for you. <laughs> well, just sort of quickly then on the, I mean, we 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 stuck very firmly and uh, obstinately with climate change for a long time, but I think there was a feeling that climate crisis and climate emergency were too emotive and were, you know, would, would, would then wouldn't sound serious with some audiences. But now I've noticed, even though we still talk about climate change or global warming or whatever in the reports, in the communications discussions, even the senior scientists will use crisis and emergency because after all, that's what it is. And actually just going off on a quick tangent on that, you were talking about the importance of risk and uncertainty. And in, the, in that working group one report that came out in August, there was a chapter for the first time on the attribution of, of uh, um, disasters or the attribution of weather to climate change and that's allowing us now to to quantify the extent to which that risk is is moving as a big scientific advance anyway and um my one takeaway i guess would be when you're talking about it and this, this is kind of implicit i think in what everyone has been saying you've got to know your your audience and you've got to tailor your remarks to the audience and whether it's a, a bunch of you know another bunch of scientists or high level policy makers or a group of in, uh, um, illiterate villagers with their own indigenous knowledge which has a you've still got to be able to tailor what's being said in and to put it into their terms so they can relate to it 
Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, very interesting. And I'm going to turn to um, Ines actually for, for your final thoughts. And I'm also going to ask you a, a sort of slip in a sneaky second question there. Um, there's a question here from Mera who says, actually, I wonder if the panel is aware of any published work reflecting on the value of engagement, right? Um, for from the perspective of researchers and institutes, not just that argues it's a good thing to do. So basically, do you know of any, any research or any work that's been referenced that evidences the value of effective research communication, science communication is, is, is what is at the heart of her question. So as you're thinking about, you know, one important thing for a takeaway, if you could also reflect on that, that'd be very helpful in a couple oh, of minutes. Wow. Yes. Oh, wow. Um, oh, goodness. Now that, that means I will have to pull up my bibliography in order to answer that question. But yes, um, there is a lot out there. And um, there is this author, Peter Rudiak Gold. There we go. I've been thinking of his name all day. Peter Rudiak Gold, who did studies on the Marshall Islands. He did the work on, he worked with them in climate engagement. There should be a book out by him. And he did studies on them, engaged with communities. Marshall Islands are sinking. They're one of the islands in the world that are fast disappearing because of climate change. And if I remember his work right, Rudiak Gold engaged with communities and found that translation. Oh, there we go. Yes, thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, he found that translation was not enough because the word climate was almost the same as the word universe. So for a changing universe, you know, just translate the changing universe to hear it is to be crippled and to not be able to do anything. So he had to engage with communities and to talk to them and um, um, work on exchanging information and discussing with them so that they were aware that what they were coming up against was a problem that they could solve and that they could work with and that they could um, mitigate slash adapt. Uh, that's just one of the many that come to mind, but I think it represents that body of knowledge that JT talks about, the voices of the disenfranchised, the voices of the poor, the voices of the many that are out there who, whose voices haven't been heard, not because they're not knowledgeable, but because they, were, they are so close to the problem, but seemingly far away from the scientists searching for their voices. Uh, there is great importance in engaging these many different groups. And if I might, I came close enough to it in my research on Typhoon Haiyan and its aftermath. In that research, we traveled in the middle of the Philippines and the great cluster of thousands of islands. We went to five different locations and asked how people understood the warnings of Haiyan. And most people thought it was because the warnings were written in English. And so people didn't understand and people didn't evacuate. But as we engaged with the communities and just that in those few hours of discussing with them and talking to them, we found that it wasn't so much translation as it was alienation. They felt so far away from their government that every time they heard warnings from the government, they thought, well, I don't hear my local official coming to my door, so I'm not going to listen. I'm just going to wait. And I think that speaks to the problems that many of us have in the science communication community, that we often rely on just a single channel to reach out to these audiences. Even the word audience presupposes both literacy and listening, which is why I love the word public so much, the many, the diverse. And um, as of that final thought, it's yes, engagement is important because Many people live on stories and they listen to stories and they listen to people and trust people close to them. And often in closing that distance, we too learn from them. We learn from their experiences and aspirations and they too perhaps can learn from us. It's an investment and an undertaking, but I've seen a lot of research around it and it's encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's, a, a, I think, a lovely place for us to move towards for the end. Andrew, I'm going to challenge you to wrap up in, in, in a couple of minutes. I know that there's a link that you want to share with us. Um, yes, take away. Well, I did share a couple of links. Uh, I, I do think this idea of 
rather than thinking about literacy as uh, or thinking about absorbing the findings of the IPCC or any other report, what, what is ideal to envision is a world where people have a little bit more of a sense of the diversity of experience and meaning so that whether you're a scientist or a journalist uh, or uh, a citizen, you're not immediately uh, thinking only about your perception of the word. And you're thinking about uh, how this language can, well, how do you be effective? There's, there's this really, I think the American Geophysical Union has this thriving earth exchange portal that is a way for communities at risk to find uh, expertise uh, uh, related to flooding or soil erosion or whatever, landslides. And uh, the challenge they face is scale, like everybody does, but it's a way to build a sustain, and it's a sustained process. It's not a one meeting, it's not a report, it's a relationship that gets built. The same thing happened with the, the Moore Foundation offered some funding to some climate scientists at Columbia and uh, University of Alaska to go to a village in, in an Inuit village, uh, in Kotzebue up in the, and to build a relationship. The money was not to, it was a climate project, but it wasn't to, we want you to go there and understand sea ice changes related to climate change. It was, I want you to build a relationship with this village. And together they've now are producing papers with the elders in the village and scientists together with those two cultural forms of expertise uh, looking at sea ice change and how it relates to community sustainability. And that those models are fantastic. They, and there, the incentive was funding that was not like a traditional grant, which is all about, we want you to improve understanding of sea ice. It was to improve relationships between publics at risk and, and expertise. Uh, my, my takeaway is uh, essentially to just find a way to where the, the core process is about communicating, building, uh, building better conversations more than telling a better story. You know, I spent 35 years, basically my whole career telling stories. It's a very uni unidirectional process and it's authoritarian. The New York Times, the BBC, we, Walter Cronkite, mm. the famous American broadcaster yes. signed off every night by saying, that's the way it is. Mm. And that was one perception of the way it is. And we, the, we're not in a world like that anymore. Uh, I will share a, uh, a just a, sort of my, uh, oh, oh yeah, here we go. Let's see if you can see this. So uh, I started this series called Watchwords and, and it's basically to build conversations around words. Who is the we? When we say climate emergency, who, who's, who's in an emergency? I'm not, I'm privileged. You know, I, I have insurance, my house blows down. Uh, so we, who is the we, you know, there is no we when it comes to energy access. There's no we when it comes to climate safety. So that's a key thing. Just think about words. I'm actually soliciting people to bring, to create like a lexicon of words like that. And um, my biggest point is that this whole journey we're on is toward building a new relationship with the climate system that happens to be a bi-directional. Our species for 99.9% .9 of our existence had a one-way relationship with climate. The key finding of the IPCC through these 33 years or so I've been writing about this is we're now in a two-way relationship with climate. We're changing the system while it's changing us and challenging us. And anyone who expects some magical seventh IPCC report or anything else to sort of suddenly change the landscape uh, I think is, is thinking wishfully. So building a better relationship with through conversation, through access is, is a great way forward. And, and in terms of the research, the IPCC report for the first time, had Dana Fisher contributed to working group three on whether activism matters. Mm. Does activism matter in terms of actually slowing climate change? No one knows yet because it can generate counter activism. But that doesn't mean you stop. So, so thinking we need to know all of this stuff also is something I think we, it's worth getting away from the expectation of, ah, yes. this is the trick, this graphic, yeah. this, this. This is a, like a thank, thank, thank you, Andrew. And I think it's a, it's a lovely place for us to, to end, which is actually to recognize the learning that we still have to do ourselves as, as, as a research community. Um, and, and 
the opportunities that that presents, um, and the urgency around it as well. As um, I am aware that we've gone over time by a bit, I want to thank um, the the panel for taking the time and, and sharing their insights. And this has been a truly stimulating conversation. And and every sort of five minutes, I feel like I have another dozen questions to ask you. <laughs> Um, but I think that's a good thing um, to thank our very engaged audience um, for, 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 for their questions and, and, and comments and observations. And of course, to thank the technical team at the ISC for hosting. We look forward to you joining us again next week, next Thursday at the same time, um, where we'll be talking about the challenges of multi-institutional collaborations and how you do science communication in that context. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, by the way, Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, thank thanks, you. colleagues. And the staff. And the questions. Really fun. <laughs> it, was, it was my pleasure. Really very interesting.